Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the IP Lunch Club. My name is Mackenzie, and I'm one of the six team members of the Sandbox Center. For those who may not be acquainted with SBX, we're located online and downtown Barrie, and we connect people and their ideas to business resources so they, they can create a better life through business. We are thrilled to be once again continuing our partnership with IP Osgood's IP Innovation Clinic. Protecting the ideas and creations of artists, inventors, and business owners allow businesses to grow and encourages innovation. For those that are joining us who may not be acquainted with the IP Innovation Clinic, maybe you haven't attended our partnered sessions that were held in our space in the past, or even last week's online session, they're an innovation to market legal clinic staffed by law students and operated in collaboration with York University's Innovation York, Norton Rose Fulbright LLP, and the International Law Research Program at the Center for International Governance Innovation. They serve a clientele that is needs-based and under, under service such as individuals or startup companies who do not have the resources to hire a lawyer, patent agent, or other advisors. Under the guidance and mentorship of supervising lawyers, Innovation Clinic Fellows provide one-to-one -one legal information services to inventors, entrepreneurs, and startup companies to assist with the innovation and commercialization processes. The partnership we hold is so incredibly unique to be able to provide the opportunity for students to have hands-on experience supporting businesses. And then similarly, for businesses to have access to this expertise is such a win-win for us. So before I continue with introducing the IP Innovation Clinic team for today's session, we're really grateful to have Barristan Law join us for this series as a presenting sponsor. The team at Barristan are not only an active and committed contributor to SBX on the regular, but continue to serve the local region when it comes to protecting business owners and improving innovation. So I'd love to introduce Alexandra Paul of Barristan Law to share a few words. Thanks so much for joining us today, Alex. Thanks for having me. So I'm an articling student at Barristan Law. I, am, I will be practicing in the solicitor department with corporate wills and real estate when I am officially called to the bar. Um, now our firm, we're a full service mid-sized firm. We have offices in Barrie, Huntsville, Collingwood and Bracebridge. We practice in the areas of civil law, um, real estate, wills, estates, corporate, um, family, estate, litigation, the list is endless. And we're just so excited to be a part of this lunch club here and excited to be sponsors. I think that this week's presentation is so important, especially in today's technology day and age. Um, everybody shares things online and protecting your work and your art is so important um, today. And I just think that everybody will have a lot to learn from this presentation and I look forward to it. Absolutely, me too. Thank you so much for the remarks, Alex, and thank you again to Barrison Law for sponsoring this series. We're super grateful. Today in part four, I can't believe it's part four of the IP Lunch Club. We're almost getting towards the end of this series. The team will have an overview of relevant Canadian laws associated with protections afforded to artists, writers, and designers under the Copyright Act. They'll also touch on accessibility issues, sorry, arising from artists' lack of general awareness of their legal rights and discuss digital fashion as an emerging creative industry, which is super cool, including how digital fashion shifts consumption models. If you have any questions at all throughout the, se the session, please use uh, the Q&A feature or the chat. We'd love to hear from you and we'll make sure to address them at the end of the session. So without further ado, let's get started. I'll pass it over to Emma of the IP Osgood team to get us going. Over to you, Emma. Hi there. Uh, once again, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us at the IP Lunch Club series. Uh, my name is Emma Abbas and I'm an aspiring IP lawyer uh, and a student at law at the IP Innovation Clinic. Um, Mackenzie has given you a wonderful introduction to the amazing work the clinic is uh, doing um, I'm coordinating today's session on behalf of the clinic. These students have worked hard to bring these informative presentations to you. Uh, if you have any questions, please reach out to us at the IP Innovation Clinic. This is a fourth of a five part series and we would encourage you to come back to join us for the last uh, of the series lunches with us uh, at the same time next week. Um, we would be grateful if you can fill out the survey which will go out at the end of the five presentations. Um, the information is available in the materials which will be sent to you by email. 
The clinic especially wants to support the underrepresented communities in Canada and highlight the creative intellect and talent these communities have to offer. So without further ado, please welcome Lamont, Lauren, and Samantha. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. I'm just gonna take a second to share our slides and we'll get started. Can everyone see this okay? Excellent. Well, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so my name is Lamont Abramchik, and today I, along with my colleagues, Sam Milato and Lauren Tacolino, are gonna be discussing issues concerning artists, writers, and designers with respect to intellectual property. Specifically, we're going to be looking at issues coinciding with copyright law. Copyright is one of, and if not the most significant areas of law concerning artists, writers, and designers. So today we're gonna to give you a crash course in copyright and canvas some recent developments in the field. I'm gonna begin by going over some of the basics of copyright, including what qualifies for protection under the Copyright Act and look at some elements of infringement. After that, Lauren's gonna talk about copyright as it coincides with street art and tattoos, specifically talking about issues that arise with respect to moral rights, questions of joint authorship, personality, and likeness. And then rounding us off, Samantha is going to take a look at copyright as it intersects with dance, fashion, and emerging uh, digital fashion industries. We ask that if you have any questions during the presentation, please post them in the chat and we will do our best to address, address them at the uh, conclusion of our presentation. Thank you. So what exactly is copyright? Copyright is something that vests in original fixed forms of expression. This means that in order to qualify for protection, your work must be original, which is to say sufficient labor skill and judgment has gone into producing it and you've created it independently. Moreover, your work must also be fixed in a tangible medium. Copyright protection does not extend to things like ideas. However, if you create something in a medium that qualifies for protection under the Canadian Copyright Act, you will automatically receive a bundle of exclusive rights with respect to the treatment of your work. Generally speaking, copyright confers the sole right to produce, reproduce, publish, or perform one's work, or a substantial part thereof. This means that if someone produces, reproduces, publishes, or performs your work, or a substantial part of it without your permission, this could constitute an infringement, which is prohibited under Section 27 of the Copyright Act. Furthermore, the Act prescribes that you can bring an action for damages or specific performance if someone infringes your copyright. For those of you who are unfamiliar with legalese, damages essentially means monetary compensation, and specific performance can be thought of as a court order or an injunction that prevents you from doing something. One more thing that I'd like to quickly add before we move on is that you can also license or assign your copyright to somebody else. A license is essentially permission to perform an action, which is generally the exclusive right of a copyright holder. Whereas if you assign your copyright to someone, this essentially means transferring ownership of copyright to somebody else, so you will no longer be the copyright owner of your work. Now that we've gone over some of the basics, to get a better sense of what copyright looks like in practice, I'm gonna run through a few scenarios with you using a painting that my friend Anya recently made. So assuming Anya's painting qualifies for protection, which is to say it meets all the requirements of original expression, and it's fixed in a tangible medium that qualifies for protection under the Copyright Act, Anya automatically has an exclusive right to reproduce her work or any substantial part thereof in whatever material form she chooses, pursuant to section 3.1 of the Copyright Act. So what might happen if someone else creates an identical copy of Anya's painting? Well, unless Anya has assigned her copyright or granted this person a license to reproduce her painting, creating an identical copy may constitute an infringement. There are certain defenses that can be raised to rebut allegations of infringement, such as fair dealing. But for now, all I want you to know is that the Canadian copyright law generally prohibits others from creating literal copies of your work without permission or consent. Now let's imagine a situation where another person sees Anya's painting, but rather than creating an identical copy, they've been inspired to create their own version of it. Remember, copyright confers the sole right to reproduce a work 
or any substantial part thereof. So even though there are noticeable differences between both works, reproducing substantial portions of someone else's work could still constitute a copyright infringement. Now here's where things begin to get a little tricky. What if instead of creating a new version of Anya's work, this, paint, this person has been inspired to photograph their own plants and share this image online? Is this something that may still constitute copyright infringement? In order to succeed for a claim for copyright infringement, there are essentially five things that you must be able to convince a court of. The first is copyright itself, which is to say your work qualifies for copyright protection and you are the copyright holder of the work. The next is substantial similarity, which means there's substantial similarities between your work and the work that you're alleging copies your work. So if we take the Agnes painting and this photograph, for example, we can see that there's substantial similarity with respect to subject matter, but they're obviously very different when it comes to style, composition, and arrangement. This might mean that Ani will have a hard time bringing a claim for infringement pursuant to the Copyright Act. If you are able to get over the hurdle of substantial similarity, you then have to be able to prove access and causal connection. The thing about copyright is that you can create something independently, which is identical to or similar to someone's work without infringing their copyright. That's because copyright only protects your work from being literally copied. So in order to show access, you have to show that whoever copied your work had access to your work in the first place. And there's a causal connection between your work and their work. Um, when I say causal connection, I mean that if there could have been another source of inspiration which uh, the copy has derived from, this might make it a little bit harder for you to actually prove that infringement has occurred in the first place. After showing access and a causal connection, you have to look at the elements of your work and figure out what is actually original. So if someone copies elements of your work and that seems to be a substantial similarity, copyright protection will only extend to original forms of expression and not things like facts, ideas, and stock devices. If it's a fact, an idea, or a stock device, which has been copied from your work, this will not constitute an infringement. And finally, you must be able to show that what has been copied from your work is actually a substantial part of it. If an element which is taken is de minimis, which means that if seen in isolation, someone would not be able to tell that it's actually a part of your work, this again will not constitute infringement either. Essentially, there's quite a high bar, and because the costs of litigation are quite high, uh, it generally might be worth seeking legal advice or an opinion before bringing a claim for infringement. It's also important to remember that copyright does not vest in all mediums. In fact, the Canadian Copyright Act only protects original literary, dramatic, musical, and artistic works. Moreover, the Copyright Act defines what qualifies for protection within each of these categories. For example, if we look at section two, artistic works include things like paintings, drawings, maps, charts, plans, photographs, et cetera, et cetera. Now, whether an original work qualifies for protection is not always abundantly clear. And this is a common issue concerning artists, writers, and designers with respect to intellectual property. So prior to attending law school, I actually completed my undergrad at OCAD University. Um, one of the most common questions that my friends and family would often ask me is, what is art? And it's somewhat of a you know, long running joke. And I'd usually say, you know what, that's a good question. The fact of the matter is, art can be pretty much whatever you want it to be, is exemplified by Marcel Duchamp and in the invention of the ready-made. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Fountain, in 1917, a society of independent artists invited all of its paying members to submit proposals for an upcoming exhibition. Duchamp, who is himself a paying member, submitted an upside down urinal, which was promptly rejected by the society. Despite the society disagreeing with Duchamp's definition of art, ready-mades have proliferated and are today recognized as a standard form of artistic practice. Artistic, literary, dramatic, and musical practices are continuously evolving in response to new technologies, markets, and social realities. New forms of expression are emerging every day, although the act remains somewhat static and fixed in time. As a result, it isn't always clear whether or not a novel medium qualifies for protection. 
With that said, I will now turn the stage over to my colleague, Lauren, who will discuss specific examples of intellectual property issues that are emerging in response to some non-traditional art forms. Thank you. Okay, thanks Lamont. Um, so as mentioned, my name is Lauren and I'll be building a little bit on what Lamont has mentioned um, regarding copyright as it relates to works that are maybe a departure from what we might typically conceive of as art, um, particularly when they um, appear on unconventional or alternative art mediums. So the definition of copyright under section two that Lamont went over is not meant to be exhaustive or to delineate between different schools of art. As we know, art can take many forms, including the examples that Lamont has given us, um, ranging anywhere from an actual canvas to upside down urinals. Typically speaking, um, copyright will subsist in any original work, um, regardless of the medium or the form of artistic expression. The requirement generally just is that it's both original and fit. And it's really the expression of the idea itself um, that will activate the protection. In practice, though, the broad applicability of copyright interests can be it can become complicated um, by those works that cross formal boundaries or engage uh, atypical mediums. So today I'll be looking at two expressions in particular, um, and those are graffiti and graffiti art and tattoos that kind of cross these boundaries and um, kind of activate a, a murkiness when it comes to copyright interests. So um, the first example I'll talk about is in the area of graffiti and street art. And it's a really interesting example of the shifting landscape of copyright law. Um, so for this, I'll flip to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so this is a mural that was created in the wake of the Black Lives Matter protests of this past summer, um, and it appears in Detroit, Michigan. So because graffiti typically appears in public spaces, um, and because it's often also created through acts of vandalism or on private property sometimes, it can be difficult to understand why it would activate copyright protections, particularly when, when we often associate it with unlawful activity. It can be kind of difficult to reconcile the legal protection of, Ill of illegal activity. But the Copyright Act actually doesn't require work to be created lawfully in order to activate protection. So typically speaking, graffiti will still be protected under the Act, even if if it is created through an act of vandalism. Now, beyond the legality of it, graffiti artists themselves have even had somewhat relaxed attitudes towards copyright, which I think is really added to the overall murkiness of the area. A really essential element of some street art, to the artists themselves included, is its temporality. So the fact that the art will exist until it's eventually painted over by, an art, by another artist. But the mere fact that graffiti art might at some future and indefinite point in time be painted over or erased will not override the fact that in most cases it is still an original and a fixed work and quals qualifies for uh, copyright protection. Now fixed in this sense um, doesn't necessarily mean permanent um, in the way that we might typically conceive as in lasting forever. I think it's more representative of something that's tangible with some degree of stability over time. It's also worth mentioning that not all graffiti will qualify for copyright protection. Some simple tags or signatures might be too small to be considered an artistic work and to, to activate those protections. Now there's a really interesting case example of the application of copyright law in practice um, in the street art context. And that's the case of Tyranny and Machino. So I'll flip to the next slide for this. Thank you. Um, so in this case, in 2015, a Brooklyn graffiti artist uh, by the name of Joseph Tierney uh, filed a lawsuit in the United States alleging that Moschino, a very prominent designer, used his graffiti mural vandalized in a modified version of one of their clothing lines. So you'll see on the slide on the left is um, the original graffiti art by Joseph Tierney, and on the right is the uh, Moschino design that appeared on Katy Perry. Um, so the design were worn, as you see, by celebrities, including Katy Perry, also appeared on Gigi Hadid. Um, and after Katy Perry wore it, as pictured here at the 2015 Met Gala, she subsequently landed on several worst dressed lists, unfortunately. Um, but I think that this is a really strong case for copyright infringement, where we see an artistic work being clearly copied almost exactly without any license or credit. Um, I think it draws on the five criteria that Lamont mentioned earlier. Um, when it comes to uh, making out a positive claim for copyright infringement. But it's also a really compelling moral rights claim as well. And moral rights are something that can be activated in the copyright sphere too. So in this case, the artist argued that the use of his art without his consent and in such a negative way, in effect ruined his street cred and was damaging to his reputation as an artist, um, which I'm sure was no doubt made worse by the fact that Katy Perry ended up on worse dressed lists. Um, so moral rights, uh, as we see here, and then more broadly in copyright can be activated 
debated where an unauthorized reproduction of a work will jeopardize either the integrity of the work itself or will affect the honor or the reput reputation of the artist. So I think this example of graffiti and, you know, graffiti more generally, falls pretty squarely within the scope of the Copyright Act and the availability of copyright protections for graffiti artists is relatively clear. You know, and I think graffiti is one example, but typically there are pretty broad rights to protect our artists and their work, um, particularly in highly commercialized arenas, as we see here, where um, art is kind of being appropriated for uh, really profit driven purposes. But where IP rights can become really complicated is when they compete, collide with other competing rights, such as constitutional rights and individual liberties. And this is really the case when the canvas for an artistic work is another human being. And this brings me to the second expression that I'll talk about today, which are tattoos. And um, so I'll flip to the next slide for that, please. Thank you. So in both Canada and the United States, if a tattoo is both original and fixed in some tangible medium, such as being inked in skin, um, and is not in the public domain, it will likely qualify for copyright protection. Now, in the area of tattoos specifically, there has been some debate as to whether a body is considered a fixed medium because it's subject to the laws of nature. And there's also some dispute over when a tattoo actually becomes fixed in the skin due to biological proceeds and the whole healing process. Uh, but there is general agreement in the legal community that tattoo art, certainly before it's inked as well as after, um, will satisfy these requirements of the Copyright Act. Challenges will often arise, though, both on public policy and charter grounds when tattoos are replicated and uh, either in the depiction of an individual that is inked themselves or when those tattoos are replicated on another human subject. Now, granted, there is very limited jurisprudence or case law on this topic in the Canadian context and even in the American context, there's not much, but there have been a few interesting lawsuits that have arisen in the United States that I'll look to today to kind of explore these examples. Um, there are two examples of them here um, that I'll point to. So on the right, we have the case of Rick Genest and 20th Century Fox. So Rick Genest, who is pictured um, on the right image of the of the right side of the screen, um, commonly known as Zombie Boy for his appearance in a Lady Gaga music video. He sued 20th Century Fox for copying his zombie inspired tattoo and likeness and a character for the American Horror Story, which uh, is pictured on the left of the right side of the screen. Um, and this, this copy was done without his permission. Likewise, on the left side of the screen, you'll see the case of Whitmill and Warner Brothers. So in this case, tattoo artist Victor Whitmill, who was artist for Mike Tyson's infant face tattoo, which you'll see on the very far left, um, claimed that the, that the tattoo that appeared on Ed Helms' face, which is right beside uh, Mike Tyson, um, appearing in the Hangover Part 2 movie, was an unauthorized reproduction of Tyson's design. Now, Whitmill here argued that he created the design for Tyson, um, and the process of inking it into his skin was a license rather than an assignment of copyright interest, which kind of touches back to what Lamont mentioned earlier. The court here um, ultimately denied Whitmill's injunction to prevent the release of the film, um, and they mainly um, provided public policy reasons for that decision. Um, but they did allow the case to go forward, um, stating that Whitmill did have a pretty strong case for copyright infringement. Now, I believe both of these cases have ultimately settled privately, so we don't have um, a decision from the court raised on the issue uh, on the issues that were raised here. But the reproduction of an original work onto a different subject could, I think, be really sufficient to make out a case for copyright infringement. Now things get slightly more complicated when an individual uses their own tattoos as part of their own image and likeness. And there are two examples that I'll look to in the American context as well um, that raised this issue. So the first is the case of Matthew Reed and Nike. Um, so in this case, Matthew Reed uh, created a custom tattoo for NBA player Rashid Wallace. Um, and it was later featured as a, if not the central uh, element of a Nike commercial after Wallace won the 2004 NBA championships with his team, the Detroit Pistons. So hopefully technology will cooperate with me, but I'd like to quickly play uh, the commercial. My wife, my queen, that's my youngest son, Nazir, my middle son, Ishmael, and my oldest son, Malik. That's me. I'm still going to get something in the cartouche. Maybe Semper Fi. We're always faithful. Okay, so hopefully you could all hear that. Um, 
but you'll see that the entire commercial really is Wallace describing the meaning behind his tattoo while they're stylistically animating and retracing the design across his skin. So when Reed, the tattoo artist, saw this commercial, he filed a lawsuit against Nike and their advertising agency for copyright infringement um, and sued for damages. Now, at the time, Reed had only received about $450 from Wallace for the tattoo, but in the statement of claim, he did acknowledge that he knew that his business would likely benefit from the exposure and visibility of having his work on an NBA player, although he might not have expected just how prominently his work would be featured um, without compensation. Now, by contrast, Wallace um, received a substantially larger, although undisclosed amount from Nike for this commercial, with no ownership interest paid to Reed. And this raises really interesting questions around um, copyright rights and license and um, really what the extent of your rights are when you are an individual that has that, that has inked themselves and, and how you can use your own personality and likeness. And I'll get to those issues in a moment, but unlike other cases, Wallace in this case actually claimed that the process of designing the tattoo was really quite collaborative between himself and the artist, um, which raised the question of joint authorship. And this has really important implications for co-ownership um, um, and licensing rights. So I'll flip to the next slide for that, please. Thank you. Um, so this here is the Section 2 definition of joint ownership in the Copyright Act. So according to Section 2, joint authorship will be found where there is substantial contribution by two or more authors to an original work. Um, now, as noted here, these contributions can't really be distinct or noticeably separate from one another in the final work. They really should be um, quite merged and sort of synonymous. In the United States, um, it's also important to note that there's a requirement of subjective intent to create a joint work too. Um, but it's really important to recall when, uh, when reading this definition that copyright, as, as Lamont mentioned earlier, protects the expression of ideas, not the ideas themselves. So when we apply this to the tattoo context, it's not uncommon for a final tattoo design to be the result of collaboration between artist and client. And I think this is especially true given individual preferences, you know, the fact that this design will be inked on your skin forever, um, and also the expertise of the artist. So without material contribution to a design in some expressed kind of drawn out form, the client might not have any copyright interest. Now in Wallace's case, it's unclear if he could claim joint authorship. Um, and this is especially true if he was only giving verbal feedback to Reed's design. Now, Nike ultimately settled with Reed, which I think to many indicates that Reed did have some legal ground to stand on here um, and could likely have succeeded in an infringement claim. But the Reed case, I think, also raises really interesting questions surrounding license to use your own body, um, particularly for commercial purposes, when it's uh, in a way the walk-in canvas for another artist's work. So in addition to disputes over authorship, I think it also raises really interesting questions at the collision of IP law and fundamental human liberty. So do individuals, particularly those individuals that are high profile, need permission from their artists to use their bodies in all their inked uniqueness as they please? Um, and how does this interact with or potentially negate the right of an artist to preserve, preserve the integrity of their work, maintain control over um, or benefit from its reproduction? So to explore this, I'll look to one final example that I think uh, highlights this conundrum really well. Um, and that's the case of Solid Oak Sketches and 2K Games. So this is an American case. Um, and in this case, a series of NBA players were portrayed in a video game uh, in their likeness, including their tattoos, without the consent of the tattoo artists themselves. So Solid Oak Sketches, which was the plaintiff in the tattoo studio, claimed exclusively licensing rights to the tattoos that appeared on about five of the NBA players in the game. And then they filed for copyright infringement um, and for reproducing the tattoos without license. Now, what's really interesting in this case is that in the lower court, um, the judges held that even if Solid Oak could claim copyright infringement, that that claim would still ultimately fail because NBA players received an implied license to use their tattoos as an element of their personality and likeness when they received them. And I think this is especially true because the tattoo artists knew that they were NBA players and they knew that their work would appear in high profile media. Now, this case continues to make its way through the American judicial system, but I think it does have merit, and it's articulated in this quote at the bottom here by LeBron James, basically just says that any depiction of him, if it's going to be done in a meaningful or, or accurate way, will include his tattoos as an important part of his image, um, and he basically has the right to license the way that he looks as he sees fit. But I think it's interesting to put this case in conversation 
conversation with the previous case. Um, there's a really noticeable distinction between the argument made against 2K games and the one made against Nike. And that's the distinction between using tattoos as part of an individual's likeness um, and to portray them accurately and reproducing a tattoo as a central, if not sole aspect of a very highly commercialized production. I think generally it seems that tattoos themselves are copyrightable, but where things get murky is in their use for commercialization and profit-driven purposes, especially when the reproduction is in some ways um, incidental to the accurate depiction of an individual. We see also that moral rights can be implicated when art, um, whether that's in tattoo form or in graffiti form, is portrayed in an unsavory context that could affect the honor of the art itself or the reputation of the artist. So I think as a takeaway to wrap up my section, um, both tattoo artists and clients, especially those that are high profile or work in the entertainment industry, would be really well advised to sign proper written agreements at the outset of a tattoo appointment to determine authorship and ownership uh, and licensing terms. And with that, I will pass it over to Samantha. We'll talk about some other art forms that activate IP challenges. Hi everyone and good afternoon. Thank you to my team members, Lamont and Lauren for providing a great breakdown of the Copyright Act and, some looked at, and a look at some interesting case law regarding alternative art forms. One of the themes running throughout our presentation is a look at diverse mediums and how they might be protected by intellectual property law. In my segment of the, of the presentation, I'm going to look at some areas the law hasn't had as much time to respond to, particularly in the area of copyright and dance and digital fashion. So while copyright was traditionally aimed at protecting authors and artists, other creatives such as record producers or performers are also afforded copyright protection. Following Lauren's discussion of copyright and the likeness of high profile celebrities, the first topic I will touch on is a look at Alfonso Ribeiro also known as Carlton from the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and his claim advanced against Fortnite developer Epic Games in effort to protect his creative expression with respect to what I will refer to as Carlton's signature dance. The video we will play shortly will outline some of the stakes at issue and provide a visual illustration of the Carlton, of Carlton character's dance following a Fortnite character doing a very similar if not identical dance. Hoping we can play that for you now. You know, that, you know the song, we've been doing it all morning. We're back now with the Carlton lawsuit. Tell us everything we need to know, Lara. <laughs> Hold on, wait a moment. <laughs> Everybody knows the dance and the guy who created it. As you said, Alfonso Ribeiro first did the Carlton name for his character on The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air back in 1991. That is a long time before Fortnite was even invented. So when a character on the video game busted out his moves without permission, Ribeiro was ready for a fight. The Carlton dance now at the center of an unusual legal battle. The iconic 90s sitcom dance to the Tom Jones tune, It's Not Unusual, created by Alfonso Ribeiro on the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Everybody knows it, and apparently it made an impression on the creators of the popular game Fortnite as well. For around $8, players can bust a move just like Carlton, Fortnite calls it the fresh emote, but Ribeiro is calling it downright illegal, and he's taking action. In a new lawsuit against the games maker Epic Games, Ribeiro claims the company has made a fortune from unlawfully and unfairly misappropriating his creative expression, likeness, and endorsement without crediting or compensating him, adding he plans to recover the revenue rightfully owed to him. And he's not the first... So ultimately, the legal dance battle didn't end in Alfonso's favor, as the U.S. Copyright Office declined Ribeiro's application to register Carlton's dance and stated that the combination of these three dance moves is a simple dance routine that is not registrable as choreography. Next slide, please. While a U.S. case, we thought it would be interesting to take a look at the Canadian Copyright Act and consider whether copyright protection could or perhaps should be extended to Carlton's dance. So pursuant to Section 5.1 of the Copyright Act, we see that copyright exists in dramatic works. And at Section 2, the definition of dramatic works includes choreographic works and scenic arrangements. Which brings us to the next question. Is Carlton dance, could it be considered choreography? If the answer to this question is yes, then Carlton's dance may be afforded copyright protection. We thought it was interesting to consider whether copyright should extend to dances similar to Carlton's, particularly in the case of viral dances, which tend to be by their very nature, very brief in duration and involve the repetition of only a few movements. 
we are curious to see how intellectual property will will develop and perhaps um, respond to copyright and dance, particularly when we consider apps such as TikTok that are built around and facilitate the creation of videos as short as 15 seconds. Perhaps intellectual property law might adapt to accommodate these kinds of dance moves. Next slide, please. So moving to our next topic, fashion presents unique intellectual property considerations. For example, a Toronto-based fashion lawyer, Ashley Foyce, in her piece to discussing IP protection for the fashion industry, she raises an interesting analysis as to whether fashion is art or a necessity. Does fashion serve a utility function, namely to clothe the human body, or is it more of an aesthetic function? And why this distinction matters is as Ashley notes that as fashion designs take on more aesthetic qualities, the possibility that intellectual property protection applies increases. In the Star Athletica case that's issued, that's viewed on the slide there, sorry, at issue was whether the cheerleading uniforms were copyrightable subject matter. In this case, their useful features, such as their shape, style, cut, and dimensions could not be copyrighted. And it's important to emphasize that it's not as if fashion designs cannot qualify for copyright protection, but rather that they might not qualify for copyright protection as a whole. So while artistic works such as logos would likely be able to claim the benefit of intellectual property protection, this may be limited to where artistic works are applied to useful articles. The reason we wanted to raise this concept of separability, where there is a separation between the useful component of fashion, such as its materials, shape or cut, and the design is to prime the discussion around digital fashion. Next slide, please. Now you may be wondering, what is digital fashion? So co-founder of The Fabricant, which is a digital fashion house we will explore shortly, defines digital fashion as anything that has to do with fashion beyond the physical realm, fashion you can wear with your digital identity. So digital fashion pushes the boundaries of our understanding of what fashion is and what it is capable of. And what becomes interesting then is when fashion exists only in its digital form, we shift and move away from fashion that clothes the human body as we are no longer dealing with physical garments. The video, hoping we have time to play it today, features um, a, a great entryway into digital fashion, what it is and some of the shifts in consumer habits that have created space in the market and a demand for, digital, for the digital creation of garments. Hoping we could play that, please. Статистики, кажется, в мире каждая десятая вещь покупается для того, чтобы сделать контент в соцсетях. И есть, например, блогеры, которые постоянно вынуждены делать контент, и они, они заказывают вещи, они покупают вещи только ради фотографии, или они их берут в аренду. Почему бы, если вещь нужна только для фотографий, не примерить цифровую вещь? Мне кажется, это очень классная возможность сделать моду экологичнее. If we could switch to the next slide, please. Perfect, thank you. So the video recently played discusses the Instagram purchase and return trend. This trend was one force that created space in the market for the digital creation of garments. The trend essentially involves the purchase of clothing for the sole purpose of creating social media content that are then either returned or discarded. With digital fashion, the same process occurs 
but more seamlessly and with less waste involved. So the photos featured on the right, on the left hand, sorry, feature the business model of Dress X, which is a digital fashion retailer based in Los Angeles, California. So one can use their phone to browse their online store, select the garment of their choice, such as the Nina doll bright red top on the right, upload a photo of themselves, and within one to two days, receive the final product of them featuring the garment, such as the photo there shown in the middle. It is estimated that 50 billion has been spent on digital fashion over the past two years, and it isn't even an industry in a real sense. Digital fashion is rapidly developing, and it'll be very interesting to see how it continues to evolve and change the fashion ecosystem. Next slide, please. This photo is just to provide an, an additional illustration of, just, of Dress X business model, sort of the before and after, how you can go from the photo in the middle to the one on the right. We can move to the next slide, please. Thank you. So digital fashion has a positive effect of bringing sustainability and inclusivity to the center of conversations about fashion. For example, the Fabricans mantra is that fashion should waste nothing but data and exploit nothing but the imagination. So you might be thinking, we still do need fashion that serves that utility function to clothe the human body. Well, digital fashion can be adapted to create more sustainable manufacturing processes. For example, the video, um, the video featured on the left features a collaboration between Puma and the Fabricant in which they applied two technologies in the production process of their collection. Puma used dope dyeing and digital printing by combining uncolored materials with digital printed or spun dyed materials. So as a result, the design team was able to reduce the water and chemical usage drastically in comparison to the conventional wet processing method. If we are able to play the video, it's about 30 seconds just to sort of show um, some of how digital fashion operates. And looks. Thank you. Oh, I see. Sorry. In the interest of time, I'll try my best to speed to speed things up. If we could move to our next slide, please. So in addition to sustainability, digital fashion can also positively impact representation within the fashion industry. For example, through the use of digital production, artists can seamlessly switch between various sizes, sh shapes, and heights of bodies. And as stated on the right side of the screen, digital fashion also raises complex collaboration and ownership scenarios. For example, as between the, 3D, the owner of the 3D software, any license holder, and the designer, and the various contracts that may exist around these relationships. For example, trademark attorney Allison Cole poses that the original designer risks losing the right to recreate their own design if they don't retain the intellectual property rights when translating their designs into 3D. In response to the potential risks that digital fashion may pose and the fact that digital fashion presents new art forms to protect, we've included some resources featured on our final slide regarding information that may assist in this area and or any other intellectual property considerations. We can move to this slide. This is just an, uh, a neat example that we thought um, sort of illustrating how brands are curating digital shopping experiences for their consumers. So it features a Hong Kong based luxury fashion retailer that commissioned the fabricant to create digital versions of their collection. Now it's important to note that this collection can be worn physically, but was presented at the point of purchase in this pop-up using only digital iterations. And consequently it taps into a different sensory experience when shopping when you aren't presented with the physical garments to touch or try on. And we can move to our final slide. So this slide features some resources and information such as the Government of Canada website that has various accessible resources on how to develop an IP strategy and how to leverage your IP. And another um, organization we want to tap uh, to sort of touch on is the Artist Legal Advice Services, which is currently running a virtual clinic where you can book appointments to receive summary legal information. And we just want to say thank you so much. And that concludes our presentation. We are really grateful to Osga's IP Innovation Clinic and the Sandbox Center for the opportunity to present to all of you today. Awesome.
Awesome. Thank you so much, team. That was an incredible presentation and so many good examples I had no idea about. I mean, if I could see Mike Tyson on the screen in the hangover, I wouldn't have ever thought that there would be a lawsuit over his tattoo being used. So really, really cool. Um, in, in regards to timing, um, I just want to be respectful of, of people's time so we can maybe get to one question. And then if anybody else has any other questions, feel free to use the chat bot um, that IP Osgood has. I know Emma threw it in the chat earlier. So um, that's great. I have a uh, question as it relates to landmarks. And for example, like the CN Tower or up in Simcoe County where the sandbox is, we have the spirit catcher that overlooks Kemp and Felt Bay. And I know a lot of people um, when on social media, they take their pictures or say influencers are taking pictures, but they don't realize that a lot of these landmarks I'm sure has kind of like copyright attached to them as well, especially for example, the McLaren Art Center, they have an artist that actually created this landmark in Simcoe County that is the spirit catcher. So maybe as it relates to landmarks and how they're used in certain media outlets, et cetera, um, how, how would that work as it, in re as it relates to copyright and protecting that, uh, that kind of artwork? Would you guys be able to touch on that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I'm sorry, can you hear me? I can't see myself. Yeah. In You're perfect. Excellent. Um, yeah, it's a good question. So generally speaking, I mean, copyright will extend to pieces of architecture. Uh, they are covered uh, for protection underneath the act and fall into the category of either, um, I think it's artistic works or one of the others, but they are defined within section two. Um, that is a general kind of issue, I guess, with respect to architecture showing up in photographs. But generally speaking, if something appears in public such as that, it's okay if it shows up in a photograph or if someone wants to draw it, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. If you ever travel on the TTC, you'll notice a lot of people uh, drawing illustrations of different subway stations and different right. designs that kind of show up there. So generally, yes, that will fall into more of a public domain, but there is certain protection which is still afforded to that architecture. So say, for example, I couldn't reproduce the blueprints for the CN Tower um, just sitting where I am and then recreate that building in another city because it will be covered by corporate protection there. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. And we have one more question here I'll get to just so it can be answered. Um, somebody's asking that they have a copyright in Canada um, as soon as, so I have a copyright in Canada, as soon as I form an artistic expression, how do I ensure that the same protection is offered in the U.S. or the world generally? Who would like to take a stab at that one? I'm happy to like iterate on that, I guess, as well. Um, yeah, so like we said, with the requirements for copyright protection in Canada, your work has to be original. And that's something which uh, you'll find in most other jurisdictions, at least in common law jurisdictions. So in Canada, the standard for originality is you have to exercise sufficient labor, skill, and judgment in order for your work to be deemed original. The work has to be fixed and it has to be in a medium that qualifies protection within the Canadian Copyright Act. In the UK, for example, their standard for originality is more so leaning towards labor and they don't care quite as much about the skill and judgment that goes into the work. So it is in fact easier to gain copyright protection in the UK. If someone in the UK were to infringe your copyright, you would have to meet their standard for eligibility and you would have to bring a case in their jurisdiction. Uh, similarly, in the US, the standard is labor, skill, and judgment, but you also have to demonstrate the level of creativity as well. So the standard for copyright protection in the US is somewhat higher than what we have in Canada, mm -hmm. and you would have to pass that bar in the US if you wanted to bring a claim for infringement. Interesting. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that answer. Well, I think that's all the time we have for today, guys. Thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. And like we mentioned before, this is our part four, but part five is next week. I can't believe a month flew by. Um, so I just threw it in the chat there. If, you, if uh, for those that are still on, want to register, that would be awesome. We are recording this session. So for those who registered and couldn't make it, we will be uh, sending this out, out as a resource afterwards. Um, thank you again to Alex from Barrison Law for joining us today. We encourage you to join us next week um, where basically the IP Innovation Clinic will introduce you to the newly launched IP Innovation 
chat bot. So where you have your questions today, you can instantly go to that chat bot, but this tool is so cool. They're going to be explaining how it's the first AI powered chat bot of its kind. And it really aims to alleviate the problem of intellectual intellectual property illiteracy in Canada. We want you to leave that session feeling confident and knowledgeable when it comes to the importance of IP literacy for entrepreneurs and the IP related problems faced by startups. So the link is in the chat there. Hope you can join us and register right away by clicking. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and we hope to see you next week. Thanks so much, everyone.